Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Sams. I'm one of the preachers for the Judson Road Church of Christ in Longview, Texas. I'm joined again by Tracy Blankenship in our study of the book of Philippians. Tracy, thanks for being with me. Today. I'm the sidekick uh, in this operation. We're in a little different environment here. Yes, sir. New digs, new chairs, kind of comfortable, yeah. different lighting. We're working our way through it. But thank you so much for being with us. We're in the middle of Philippians chapter 2. Open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. And that's where we're going to start in just a few moments, Tracy, after we kind of review where we are in the book of Philippians. Philippians, written by Paul and uh, to the Church of Philippi. Yes, this is a novel idea. Absolutely. And uh, which is just north of Greece and uh, a church he established on his second missionary journey. And um, uh, you can read about that journey in the book of Acts, chapter 16, I believe. And so... Anyway, uh, he's writing a letter to them, and uh, it's, it's a very good letter, very positive, very reinforcing. Uh, it's a great study for us, Tyler. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I would agree with that. So we're, we're really focusing on the role that Jesus plays in the lives of believers here in the book of Philippians. Yep. Uh, we looked in chapter 1 about being partakers in Christ and what is involved in that. Chapter 2 really emphasizes believers as the people of Christ. Paul writing to the Philippians here with some of the difficulties they were dealing with and the hostile environment in which they were living. And he's reminding them to live like they are the people of Christ. Yeah. I think of it as being kind of the, the fundamentals of Christianity, the just the basics. Um, and he, he's not into deep subject matter or nuts and bolts of Christianity. It's more about how to treat people, how to be a leader, how to do certain things, and sure. how, to, how to be a follower of Christ. And that really is the focus here. Uh, Paul has called on the Philippians earlier in the chapter, verses 1 through 4, to be unified, to possess the same mind, the same love, uh, to be willing to defer to one another in humility, that it's not all about me and what I want. It, it's about looking out for the best interests of others. And then in verse 5, Paul makes that transition. After talking about looking out not only for our own interests, but for the interests of others, he immediately then transitions into this discussion of Jesus. Have this mind or this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's well, that's where we left off last week. It, verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also. So if we're going to be the people of Christ, we've got to live like Christ. We've got to have his mindset, his attitude. And a basic understanding of what the mindset of Christ was. And I think that's where we're headed. And that's exactly where Paul heads then. If we're going to have this attitude and mindset of Christ, then we've got to know something about Christ and his attitude and his mindset. And so that's where Paul's going to take us, beginning in verse 5, and really taking us through verse 11. If we're going to understand how to be the people of Christ, we've got to understand who Christ was and how he lived. And that's what Paul's going to concern him with here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Tracy, I'm going to read verses 5 through 8, if you'll read verses 9 through 11. All right, let's do it. All right, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, so as you look at this section, Tracy, let's first just take this section and, and kind of trace what Paul is telling us about Christ. So what is this overall message of Philippians 2, 5 through 11 as it relates to Jesus Christ? You look there at verses 5 and 6. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus had an attitude here fundamentally that, that does not look out only for himself, right? Yeah, he was very not self-centered, that he was focused on others. Which is exactly the point Paul was making in chapter 2 and verse 4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. Have this mind, the mind that looks out for others, in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're going to see Jesus being the picture and embodiment 
of this humble looking out for others instead of self attitude. That's what we're going to see here and, in Jesus. And I see him coaching them up as a church, as a body of people, that they need to be looking out after each other. Absolutely. That's, That's going to be a fundamental part of this lesson. <laughs> Keep on here then. Uh, we look at verses 6 and 7. Jesus has this humble concern for others, and this humble concern for others leads him to become a servant, to take on the form of a servant. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, or made himself of no reputation, depending on the translation you're reading from, taking the form of a bondservant. That really is the focus here, Tracy, that he takes on himself the form of a servant. Here is Jesus, who himself is God, right? We studied that this past Sunday, John chapter 1. Jesus himself is God. Jesus himself is divine. He created the world, but now he's coming into that world as a man. He's God, yeah. but he's coming in flesh, and he's going to live life on this earth like you and I do. Yeah. This, that balance of humility and exaltation and how they're linked up with each other and how that fits very well in the church, even in the church today, Tyler. Absolutely. I think so. So, Jesus' concern for others led him to take the form of a servant. That's what we're seeing here. The text, of course, Tracy, and, and we probably should add this in just because this text can be rather troublesome for some people. Nothing in this text says that Jesus stopped being God. Right. Nothing says that, that, that he gave up his divine nature. But the focus of the text is that Jesus became a servant. He is the creator. He was there at the beginning. He is God himself, but he became a servant. He submits to the will of the Father and enters into the very world that he created. And not just enters it, Tracy, but as we look at verse 8, he enters this world, found in appearance as a man, and ends up doing what in verse 8, Tracy? Becoming obedient to the point of death. He becomes obedient to the point of death as a servant. His servanthood then is expressed in his incarnation and in his atoning death. When we talk about incarnation, that's kind of one of those fancy words. And it comes from Latin and maybe you speak a little Spanish or order Mexican food at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You understand what incarnation means. Sometimes you order carne asada, right? Mm -hmm. Strips of steak or strips of flesh. Mm -hmm. When we say incarnation, literally just means in the flesh. Jesus came in the flesh. That was one way that his servanthood, not only to God, but also to humanity, was expressed. But Tyler, when I see verse, verse was it 8, about the obedient to the point of death, I, I think of, you know, it's one thing to be obedient, to do what you're told or, or whatever the expectations are, but to carry that all the way to, all the way through to the point of even death. You know, usually we, we don't think of having to carry out an act of obedience that far, but he carried it all the an way. An act of obedience costing you something and costing you to, something. To that degree, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So his, his servanthood is expressed in his incarnation and his atoning death. And then this section is going to wrap up in verses 9 through 11 where we have Jesus being exalted. Because his service pleased God, he is rewarded and he is exalted now high above every name that is named so that at the name of Jesus, verse 10, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He died as a humble servant, but here is God vindicating him and he is now Lord of all. Every tongue will confess him. That really is kind of our, our summary here of Philippians 2, 5 through 11. But Tracy, we've been emphasizing over and over again, this is a very practical book that has very practical lessons for us. So let's look at, at these points that we're seeing and see what the practical application is to our lives. For example, here in chapter 2 and verse 6, if Jesus is our example, if we're to be the people of Christ, we've got to resemble Christ. If Jesus is our example, he left the glory of an existence with God in heaven to serve others. That's verse 6 who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Tracy, if he's willing to do that, what, what's our practical application from this verse? If he's willing to go and leave an existence with God and come to the earth that he created, that's sacrifice mm -hmm. on behalf of others. 
uh, reminds me of the sermon Sunday morning, comparing the first part of John to the first part of Genesis yeah. and so forth. Uh, but yes, it's uh, that what where he where he came from and now where he's where he's at now with them. So if Jesus is willing to leave this gloried existence with God in heaven and come to the earth. Are we willing to sacrifice in the service of others? Because that's ultimately what this text is all about. Right. And to them, it's still, uh, as the Philippian church, this is what he's telling them, what the direction y'all need. It's not, ex it's not uh, a lot of detail, but the general principle of humility, and I think of humility and exaltation. But This is what the mind works. of Christ, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, this is what the mind, mind of Christ, Christ does. Looks like. Exactly. Yeah. It looks for others and it serves them, even if it's going to cost me something. Which is, I think, really one of the big points we're going to see over here in verse 8, that Jesus here experiences what it's like to be obedient to God, right? Chapter 2, verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The idea that Jesus is our, is our example is really a fundamental tenet throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament, and especially here in the book of Philippians. That Jesus is our example, we're to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor is any deceit found within his mouth. Or as Paul says here, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's, he's our example. We're to follow after him. We're to conform our lives to him. Well, here's what he did. He lived in obedience to God. And the application to, to keep it in line with the Philippian church, you are a church, you are a congregation of people. And this idea of obedience, this idea of unto death, this idea of leadership, I, I keep seeing it as humility and leadership and exaltation. Those are principles that as a church, as a congregation of people, that he was wanting them to understand. Absolutely. Sometimes we can feel, Tracy, like, when we've made this decision to follow after Christ, we're going to find ourselves sometimes in difficult circumstances. It's not all a bed of roses just it's because not. you... Uh... And, and we, can, we can find ourselves, you know, crying out, does God really love me? If God loved me, why would he allow these difficult things to happen to me in my life? Am I, am I really following God? If I was following God, would I be going through these hardships? But that's where this example of Jesus can be so beneficial to us. That here is somebody who, who lived in absolute accordance with the will of God, but still suffered. And, and I think that that's the next point we draw out from this text. Jesus experienced suffering and rejection in the service of God. Just because we choose to serve God doesn't mean that our lives are going to be free from hardship. There is a promise, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But the reality is, if we choose to serve God in this life... There are going to be moments when it's difficult. Right. And the, the exaltation, the good parts, the positive is there. And it's going to be there, but you don't get to escape the, any negativity. It is, it is a process. And Jesus didn't circumvent anything bad or hard. He had to go he through faced it. incredible hardships. What sort of example would he be for us if he didn't go through it? That's that? right, if it had been easy for him. Or if it had been easy for Paul. And then all of a sudden these Christians are having to endure tough times. Exactly. Not a good example. I think about what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. That in all things Jesus had to be made like his brethren in order to be a merciful and faithful high priest, high priest. in things pertaining to God. Yeah. For Jesus to be our redeemer and our high priest, he had to experience what you and I experience. And he did. Right. And we, we get to look at it through a book through thousands of years of history, you know, they were living it in the moment, in the time, and him having to teach that lesson to them was of great value. It's awesome. And you look at how Jesus, how Jesus experienced this obedience to God, even in the midst of rejection and hardship. Jesus did it without sinning. And I think that's our example, too, that Jesus lays down this example that, that we can follow God. Now, admittedly, we sometimes make decisions that, that fall far astray of what God would have us to right. be. But the reality is, and this is what Paul's going to get at probably in our next study in verse 12, it's our choice whether to follow or not. 
And we can make that choice to follow or not, to follow the example of Jesus. Yeah. And following the example of Jesus is worthwhile because of what we read in verses 9 through 11. Jesus is the perfect example of a faithful God rewarding those who keep his will, right? Here is Jesus. He has been crowned with suffering and death. But now what has God done? He's raised him exalted. from the dead and exalted him into the heavens, right? Verse 8 is that obedience unto death all the way to the end. And then verse 9, God has highly exalted him, bestowed upon him a name that is above every name. The promise is not that, that we will get that same exact reward that Jesus got, but the promise is that the God who was faithful in rewarding his son who kept his will is the same God who is faithful to reward us for keeping his will. And that concept of the humble servant is what gets you exalted. And to them as a church, if you will humble yourselves and serve each other, you will be a, 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 a true church and a true light into the world and all the things it was meant to be. If you humble pretty, yourself... You will be exalted. Exalted. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. It's a passage from the Old Testament and the New Testament, That's right? A great message. It is. Here is Jesus. Here is the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be humble. We're going to esteem others better than ourselves. We're going to be servants. And in the end, we'll receive the reward from the faithful. And Tyler, that's the church I want to be a part of. Absolutely. You know, that's what I hope the church that we have here is that church like he's talking about trying to be in Philippians. Great point. Appreciate you being with us yes. today. Thank you for joining us in this study of Philippians chapter 2. We will pick up next week in verse 12. Hope you have a great day. Good to see you. We hope to see you soon.